1609, the first image of the moon was drawn based on observations through a telescope. It showed the major craters in Mare with the termination line passing through them. And the man who drew them, of course, was not Galileo. It was actually a British guy named Thomas Harriet. He beat Galileo by about six months. Fast forward through 353 years of dreaming about going to the moon, and all it took was one Cold War, $24 billion, and hoochah, 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 moonwalk. 650 million enraptured people watched as humans walked on the moon for the first time, and only three and a half years later, the public was so disinterested, the entire program was canceled. But yeah, let's talk some more about how TikTok is ruining our attention spans. I mean, it is, but also people are just generally sh now, in fairness, we did have a lot going on at the time. We had proxy wars, runaway inflation, over-the-top gas prices. Can't imagine what that must be like. So we didn't stay. But that's all right. We got what we came for. We took the W and we went home. Besides, we didn't even know if we could stay without any water on the moon. And we really didn't know how to reclaim water, grow food, or a million other little things that we'd need for long-term space travel. So NASA focused on that. First with Skylab, then the shuttle and the ISS and our moon ambitions kind of waned. Get it? Like, like a like waning, like a waning moon? Like a waning and waxing moon, like waning? Yeah. But on July 31st, 1999, almost exactly 30 years after Apollo 11, something interesting happened. NASA's lunar orbiter, uh, it was called Prospector, it was reaching the end of its lifetime, and the plan was for it to go out with a literal bang. They wanted to crash it into the lunar surface both to prevent a buildup of space debris around the moon, but also they were hoping that the crash would sort of create a plume that they could analyze and determine what was under the surface. That plume turned out to be smaller than what they were expecting, but they did detect hydrogen, which got NASA thinking, and they decided to go bigger. NASA had a companion mission for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter mission, and that was called LCROSS, the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite. So they decided to do the same thing with El Cross, only this time they would crash the entire upper stage Centaur rocket into the surface and then fly El Cross through the plume. And this time, it worked. El Cross's spectrometers picked up water ice. And just like that, the idea of returning to the moon got a lot more interesting. Water ice meant lunar colonies. It meant fuel that could be made from the water. And this time, we learned a lot more about long-term space habitation from the ISS. It was now officially time to go back. Okay, so we found some water, but the question is, how much water? Well, the estimates start at 108,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools to 240,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. And if that means nothing to you, which, why would it, you could also compare it to the same size as Lake Winnebigashish in Minnesota. Because we're all familiar with that lake, I'm sure. And by the way, we could find more. Missions like the LRO and LROC are still actively mapping the moon to greater and greater detail, so there's still more we could find. Of course, it's not just water. We've also found helium-3, which would be huge if we ever crack fusion, as well as iron and thorium. I've done a whole video on moon mining, you can go check that out. We are, of course, not the only country interested in getting our hands on those sweet, sweet moon resources. Several private companies are investing in it, but also China. So yeah, if the only reason that Apollo ever happened was because we were in competition with another superpower, well... <laughs> as OK Go once said... All of which brings us to Artemis, which is super close to popping off, maybe in the next few months. So I decided to do a really deep dive into the Artemis program with a three-part series. This is the first in that series, which will focus on uncrewed and robotic missions. Part two will focus on the scheduled crew missions, and part three will explore the future of the program and where we go from there. So strap yourselves in, kids, because it's about to get lunar up in her. So the first thing we need to do before we put boots on the regolith is to find that sweet, sweet moon juice. I should really just call it water. That's kind of gross. So the first planned robotic mission is called Prime-1. No relation to Amazon. Prime-1 is going to probe the lunar surface with its drill, but it's going to be able to reach it all the way down to three feet under the surface. Just for perspective, the Mars rovers are some of the most advanced robots ever created, and they can only drill down a couple of inches. Prime's drill will hunt primarily for water ice, for all the reasons we just talked about. By the way, in case you're wondering, four astronauts on the moon require 12 gallons of water and that doesn't even get into the propellant use and the use for growing food and that kind of thing. And for right now, anyway, Prime 1 is scheduled to land in December of this year, 2022. Following Prime 1 is VIPER, which stands for Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover. Just so you know, there's gonna be some major acronym game in this video. 
Viper will also be looking for water ice, but this one's gonna be exploring sunless craters. Just in case you don't know what the big deal is about the sunless craters, basically there are craters at the poles of the moon where the angle that the sun hits it means that there are certain areas down at the bottom of the crater where the sun never actually lands. And it's thought that there could be a lot of water ice down there, like a lot. I mean, think about what a cool job that is. Somebody's gonna be piloting a remote control robot through a crater that hasn't seen sunlight for billions of years. And because it's gonna be in a place where the sun doesn't land, uh, it can't power itself through solar panels. So it's, it's only gonna have about 100 days of power. Viper will have a top speed of 0.45 miles per hour, so not gonna win any races, but that's not the point. That's not what we're there for. We're there for it to go around and find water ice, and it's gonna be able to cover 12 miles in that effort. Hopefully they'll find some cool spots for astronauts to check out later on. Another interesting fact, since it's gonna be in the darkness the entire time, Viper will be the first rover with headlights. Viper is scheduled to land in November 2023 via the Astrobiotics Griffin lander carried by the SpaceX Falcon Heavy. But perhaps the biggest uncrewed mission won't ever even land on the moon. It's going in a lunar orbit. A very weird lunar orbit. What I'm talking about is the Lunar Operation Platform Gateway, which sometimes just goes by LOP-G, though these days it usually just goes by Gateway. Simply put, this is a space station. The fifth space station ever built and the first space station to orbit around the moon. Think of it as part space station, part laboratory, part fuel depot, part spacecraft launcher. It's basically a Swiss army knife in the sky, but for science. So while I call it an uncrewed mission, I'm talking about the launch to the moon. Later on, it will definitely house a crew of people that will remain in orbit around the moon the entire time. And there'll be several launches because just like the ISS, Gateway's gonna be put together in segments. The first two modules to go up will be the power and propulsion element and the habitation and logistics outpost, or the PPE, and the HALO. Right now, both modules are scheduled to launch on a Falcon Heavy in November 2024 and reach lunar orbit in nine to 10 months. That orbit, by the way, is wild. It's called the Near Rectilinear Halo Orbit, or NRHO, and it's a wildly elliptical polar orbit that swings as close as 3,000 kilometers from the surface all the way out to 70,000 kilometers. It's an orbit that takes an entire week to complete. This ensures that the station never goes behind the moon and loses radial contact with Earth, but it's also more efficient because it takes advantage of Lagrange points. And by the way, one mission that already launched is called Capstone. It actually launched in a Rocket Lab Electron, and uh, it's like a little nanosat, a little tiny satellite, but it's gonna kind of test out this, this halo orbit that they wanna do for the gateway to kind of make sure it's feasible and, and just make sure that it's something that's uh, sustainable over time. In 2025, the first crew should arrive on the Artemis III mission and new modules will be added. Uh, the Orion Command module that the crew will use to get there and also the European Service module made by ESA. Following that is the IHAB module and the Espirit module. The IHAB will extend the LOPG's communication capabilities and will feature a science airlock which can be used to release things like CubeSats. And the Espirit module will do several things. It'll provide refueling, additional comms equipment, more habitation space, and an airlock. And in 2027, the Gateway will receive the Canada Arm 3, made in, obviously, Croatia. I hate that I have to do this. It was a joke. It was in Canada. It's from Canada. It's Canada Arm. It's from Canada. I have to clarify these things. JAXA will also assist by providing habitation components and logistics resupply. Russia was supposed to be helping down the line, but, uh... Let's just say that's iffy now. Altogether, the Gateway will provide 125 cubic meters of space or 4,400 cubic feet. The idea of the Gateway is to serve as a way station, a, a hub of sorts between the lunar system and the Earth system, and it's a pretty old idea. I did a video a while back about the uh, original plans that NASA had to follow up the Apollo missions, and it did involve multiple stations in low and high Earth orbit and then in lunar orbit. Uh, and it does make kind of sense, but it's not without its detractors. An ex-NASA director named George Abbey said, quote, we should go directly there, not build a space station around it. For many, it's just an unnecessary extra step that only adds to the cost and the complexity of the whole thing as opposed to just a moon direct approach. In fact, as I was about to record this, an article was released on Nars Technica that, that really throws a lot of cold water on the Gateway idea. It talks about a recent NASA report that shows some delays in the uh, Gateway, which is to be expected, but uh, it reports that, quote, NASA's revised schedules will require most or all the capability of the SLS rocket during that time frame, and they could preclude the agency from developing a greater focus on lunar surface activities. In other words, the Gateway is kind of taking up all the oxygen in the room with the Artemis program and could eventually be deemed unsustainable and scrapped. But for now, anyway, it is still part of the plan. A very, very big part of the plan. When astronauts do finally return to the moon, it will be anything but a barren wasteland. They'll have plenty of supplies sent before their landing so they can be fully equipped from the start. 
NASA will make it rain supplies by partnering with private companies through their CLPS program, which stands for Commercial Lunar Payload Services. They're basically just creating a platform for commercial partners to fulfill orders for the cargo they need. And they call that platform PRISM, the Payload and Research Investigations on the Surface of the Moon program. Seriously, with acronyms in this program, it almost makes the whole thing worth it. So basically, yeah, NASA puts out a call for whatever type of cargo they might need for the crew on this PRISM program, and then their commercial partners can vie for the job and then line up with the launch provider. It's kind of like Match.com, but for aeronautics. Or if you don't want a metaphor, NASA describes it like this. PRISM is a solicitation for new pilot investigations through individual suits of instruments that are either destination agnostic or uniquely adopted for certain lunar geologic terrains, featuring a catalog of instrument and technology demonstrations that are available from the science community or Match.com for space projects. The PRISM program is expected to fulfill contracts until 2028 and will help supply astronauts after they land and before they arrive. Some notable supply drops that are coming are as follows. A solar cell demonstration platform that will enable long-term solar solutions for the moon missions to come. This will be in the first batch. Stereo cameras to better study how engine plumes affect lunar dust, which is a major concern, so very important. Ranger, an autonomous rover the size of a briefcase that will travel the moon and create highly detailed 3D maps. Then there's PlanetVac from Honeybee Robotics. This will land and then take a sample, which will then be taken off into space and collected. Coming a little bit later will be the Lunar Vertex, which will investigate the mysterious lunar swirl at Reiner Gamma, which has been drawing speculation since the Renaissance. And last but not least is the Farside Seismic Suite, which will place two seismometers on the far side of the moon. It is not, as the name suggests, going to drop off cartoons featuring overweight cows. Other payloads of the moon will be various supply drops for the crew once they get there, like any faraway operation that success hinges on the ability to keep them supplied with necessities. And the present program will be able to facilitate that. So as you can see, there's a lot more to the Artemis program than just the SLS, however you might feel about it. These uncrewed and robotic missions are designed to set the stage for long-term habitation of the moon. And in the next video, we're going to look at the people who will be sending up there and how all that's going to work. And that video is scheduled to come out, uh... Eventually. Sometime. In the meantime, have you ever wondered how your favorite YouTubers and content creators get that slick B-roll from all around the world? Like, they have teams of filmmakers in every country on call to shoot stuff for them? How do they do this? Well, here's a little inside tip from a YouTuber. Um, we cheat. Yeah, we use stock footage services like today's sponsor, Storyblocks. Storyblocks is a new sponsor on this channel, but uh, here's the thing, you've actually seen them on this show for a long time. I've actually been using Storyblocks for years. Like, here's the little trick that I use. Like, sometimes I have a line that has a lot of science-y terms in it, a lot of hard-to-pronounce words, or maybe it's just a really particularly long paragraph that I just want to get just right, uh, and I don't want to screw it up. What I do is I just read it, and then just throw some stock footage on top of it. Smart. But really, the main reason that I and, and my editor, Nick, uh, use Storyblocks more than any of the other stock footage services is because, actually, we started using them a long time ago simply because we didn't have a whole lot of money. Storyblocks is one of the least expensive services with, I think, the highest quality for what you pay for. So if you're a new creator, you're just getting your feet wet, um, it probably has the lowest barrier of entry. They work off a subscription, and there are various levels that you can sign up for that can suit your budget. Uh, you get unlimited downloads, so you don't have to, like, henpick what you want to see. They also have royalty-free music and sound effects, graphics, templates for After Effects, and Premiere Pro, pretty much anything that you need to do some really cool creative stuff that you maybe couldn't afford to do before. Anyway, I can't say enough good things about Storyblocks. They've been a huge boon to my channel. I'm sure you'll feel the same. Just go to storyblocks.com slash Joe Scott to tell them that I sent you and start looking around, see what kind of ideas you get. Seriously, I get people all the time asking me for advice on how to start a YouTube channel, how to run a YouTube channel or whatever. Well, this is one of my biggest pieces of advice. You don't have to do everything on your own. There are services out there that you can take their footage and it makes your quality of the videos that you make go through the roof. And in my experience, Storyblocks is the easiest one to get you started. Big thanks to the Answer Files on Patreon and the channel members who are helping to support this channel, keep things kind of regular so I can have a regular flow of content. It's, it's really helpful. And they're forming an awesome community. I can't thank them enough. But I got some new names to shout out real quick. We've got Frederick Benton, Fridjan, something Nordic, uh, Norm Rett, Vinitorns, Funk Doctor, Michael Kiefer, uh, Steve O'Nash, Dave Mitchell, Davi Ross Reese, Cassie Moore, Alyssa Richard, Andrew M. Gross, MD. We got a doctor among us. Cyber and Ramon Jaimez. Thank you guys so much. Uh, if you would like to join them and get early access to videos, also get a little thing by your name so you stand out in the comments. Makes you a little bit special. Just hit the join button right down below here on YouTube. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, you might check this one out. Google will send you to some wonderful place that 
uh, has me talking, so it's up to you if you think that's wonderful or not. But if you want to do that or check out any of them that might be on the side over here that have my face in the thumbnail, uh, go check them out. And if you enjoy them, I do invite you to subscribe if you're not, because I do come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there and have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.